Hello everyone, this is uh, Daryl Hill for COMP 2402, uh, sections A and B, uh, the next in a series of video lectures. Um, so the last few lectures we were talking about uh, balanced binary search trees and different ways of rebalancing. Uh, so today is going to be a bit of a departure from that, although it, uh, it's going to contain some things that you have seen before uh, in TREEPS. Um, so today we're going to talk about binary heaps, and uh, binary heaps are based on Eitzinger's method, um, if I pronounce that correctly, I'm not sure, but it's a method for recording ancestry in an easy to find way. So if a person has a record on page X, their father would be on page 2X and their mother would be on page 2X plus 1. Um, and this is a way to uh, have a book fill of full of all your ancestors and no gaps. So here's an example. Uh, page one would be me. Um, page two would be my dad because it's uh, two times page one. Uh, page three would be my mom because it's two times page one plus one. Uh, my grandfather, my father's father would be, uh, so my, if my dad was on page two here, he would be on page 2 times 2. Uh, his mother would be on page 2 times 2 plus 1. And then uh, my mom's father would be on page 3 times 2. So that's 2 times 1 plus 1 times 2. And uh, her mother would be on, of course, uh, this is 3 times 2 plus 1, etc. So that's sort of, uh, and then you get a book that's full of, uh, there's no gaps and uh, and you can easily find uh, one of your ancestors. So um, a heap is an implicit binary tree stored in an array uh, using Eitzinger's method, essentially. <coughs> so what we do is if we have this, we have this implicit binary tree, um, and it's implicit because it's not actually stored as a binary tree. Um, it's stored as an array. <coughs> Um, but if we, it still holds the same general structure, we just, uh, we're going to store it differently. So we start, our first element, A is the root, and that's stored at index 0. Um, and then we look at the left child of A is B, so that's stored at index 1. And the right child is C, and that's stored at index 2. And essentially, we're going to do a breadth-first search through this tree. Um, so that would go something like this. And this is the order that uh, all of these elements would go in. <coughs> um, and yeah, so we label the indices. Um, so it's it's very similar to Eitzinger's method. The difference is we start at uh, index zero instead of page one. So that means the um, the calculations are going to be a little bit different. Um, so a couple of things to note: the shape of the binary tree. If there are no gaps in the data, then it is a perfectly balanced binary tree where all levels are completely full, except possibly the last one. So you can see that here. Um, using this method, um, as long as, you know, we could keep adding things here, and this would just go into the next, uh, let's say this was I, this would just go into the next one here, and then we get, I think, J. So as long as we keep adding things in this breadth-first search way, um, then our array is not going to have any gaps in it. So we kind of want to maintain that. So we want, you know, to be memory efficient. <coughs> yeah, didn't I mention this earlier? Calculation is slightly different from Eitzinger's method since the first index is zero and not one. So if we look here, um, uh, we see from index zero, the left child's at one and the right child's at two. Um, from index one here, we see uh, the left child is three and the right child is four. And uh, so you can start to see the pattern, and the pattern is essentially for the left child, we're going to do uh, 2 times our present index plus 1, and for the right child, we'll do 2 times our present index plus 2. Um, so that's, uh, you can go back and verify that for any of those locations. Um, and then we can use algebra to find out, uh, so those are, you know, we'll make methods that uh, return the left child and the right child if I give you an index. Um, and we're going to use these expressions to do that. Um, but we also want one that's going to find the parent. Uh, unfortunately, the to compute the parent 
of an index um, is different depending on whether you're a left child or a right child. So we can use a little algebra to get the reverse of these. Um, so if i is the parent, um, then just doing uh, algebra on this gives us that i is equal to the left child minus 1 over 2. And we can do the same for the, uh, if it's uh, the right child of a parent, then the formula to get the parent is i equals the right child minus 2 over 2. Um, but we don't want different formulas. It would be better for us if we could just have one formula that, uh, so if I send in an index i and ask for the parent, uh, I only need one formula. I don't need to check if I'm the left child or a right child, although that wouldn't be super difficult. But uh, what we can do is take advantage of integer division. So in integer division, um, since we know that if you're a right child, uh, 2i plus 2 is going to be an even number. Um, so that means uh, this is going to be an odd number. And, uh, and because we're using integer division, it's going to throw away the remainder. So uh, the right child of i minus 1 over 2 is, is going to be the equal to the right child of i minus 2 over 2. Uh, and that's equal to this. So that means um, we can just use this minus 1 over 2 uh, in order to get our parent. So let's, it might seem a little confusing here, but um, hopefully you're following a little bit. But we're, we're going to see more examples so, you, so you'll be able to see how that works. <coughs> so here's a little bit of the structure of our binary heap. <coughs> um, so uh, we have an array to hold our data. So we call that A. So we're back to sort of these array-based data structures, and uh, so a lot of the things you learned while we took array-based data structures will be applicable here. Um, we keep track of, of course, the, uh, the number of elements in our binary heap. And we have these functions that we just computed, so uh, the uh, left, uh, the right, and the parent, as we talked about, uh, this works for both, whether it's a left child or a right child, because of the properties of, of using integer division where it throws away the remainder. And then there's of course going to be some other methods. <coughs> okay, so then what is this good for? Um, well, we're going to implement a prim priority queue interface. So that means uh, when we add something, it adds it to the heap, and when we remove, it removes the least element from the heap. So then this is sort of, you know, if you're in a hospital waiting room, well, geez, that's a bad example, but uh, if you're in a hospital waiting room um, and you are, uh, you know, really in big trouble, then you're a higher priority, so they take you first, and the uh, people who just have uh, bumps and scrapes uh, have a lower priority, and they, they will get in later. <coughs> um, and this is actually this, so this is a heap property. Um, so we learned about treeps, which maintain the binary search tree property on the data, and the heap property on the priority. So every time we made a node, um, we had data that we had to store, but we also assigned it a random priority. And so what, what made treeps work is that they maintain both of these properties, <coughs> but uh, on different elements of their nodes. Um, so heaps maintain the heap property on data. And what that means is that um, <coughs> the parent of a node is less than or equal to uh, the left and the right child. Right? So the parent of a node is going to be less than both of its children. Uh, another way to express that is that uh, the child is greater than or equal to the parent. Okay, so let's, uh, and an example of a heap is right here, and this maintains the heap property. So um, one is less than both of its children, 9 and 7. And over here, 9 is less than 14 and 10. And 7 is less than 8. So what you end up with is this. And you'll notice it's not in any kind of sorted order, but it is in sort of a little bit of order in the sense that, uh, you know, as you go down through the tree you're going to, or heap, you're going to get higher and higher values. <coughs> um, that's why we call it a heap, because it's, you know, partially ordered, basically. It's not a, you know, a stack or something where everything is well ordered. It's it's called a heap because that implies that it's a little bit disheveled or disordered. And then of course, uh, you know, if this is a heap, we uh, 
use our Eitzinger's method to store it in an array. So we just do a breadth first search, or breadth first search ordering would be more accurate. And uh, and that's how we would store it in our array. So um, now uh, we want to implement the priority queue interface. So let's let's take a look at how we do that. <coughs> So our problem is we want to add and remove while maintaining the heap property. Um, so the heap property is important because you know it keeps things in the in the order that we want. <laughs> so let's see. Here's an example of a of a heap and a um, and the uh, array that goes with it. And we're going to try to add six. And uh, we don't want gaps in the array. So uh, what we're going to do is, <clears throat> well, we're going to add six at the at the first available location. All right, so let's go. Uh, so we've added six at location twelve. So if we go back up here, I'll draw it in, and then we'll look at the actual neatly done example. So that's that's what's going to happen. We're going to add six to the last part of the array. Um, remember, this is just this doesn't exist. This is just a model of what is in the array. There's no pointers here. There's no nodes. Um, all we have is an array of, of uh, elements <coughs> and a way of organizing it that works like a tree. Um, so we add the six to the last location, and now we've we've violated the heap property. So this is uh, uh, we've added it, and uh, we don't have any gaps in the array, but we have violated the heap property, which is uh, what we don't. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to compare it to the parent and then swap it out. Um, so we're going to, you know, in this case, uh, 6 is less than 50. So we have 6 here and 50 is the parent. And we can compare those two and we can see that uh, those two violate the heat property. So we're going to swap 50 and 6. Um, but how do we do that in a tree? It's fine. You look at your parent pointer. Um, but using this array method we have to use our parent method um, so if you recall this is return i minus one over two so that's how we're going to determine our parent so what we want to do is we want to um, basically compare a of i and see if it's uh, greater than a of parent i Um, and in this case, i is equal to, well, we can see here, i is equal to 12. That's where we've added 6. Um, so if we want to compute the parent, so it's going to be 12 minus 1, which is 11, divided by 2, which is going to give us uh, 5. And uh, that just so happens to be exactly where we find the 50. Um, so it's quite easy to compare to our parent when we have these uh, these little methods here that tell us exactly where these things, where all of our relatives should be. <coughs> all right, so we compare ourselves to 50, and uh, we find out that we are less than 50, so we do a swap. So uh, 50 goes into location 12, and 6 goes into location 5. And then we're going to do the same thing again. So we're going to check with our parent. Um, 6 is in location 5. If we look back up here, uh, 5 minus 1 is... 4 divided by 2 is 2, so the parent of 5 equals 2. 2 just so happens to be where we find the 8. Um, so we can compare ourselves again, and we see, ah, we got to make another swap. <coughs> so we swapped 8 and 6. And now 6 is in location 2. Um, if we look at our parent, so i is equal to 2, i minus 1 is 1 divided by 2 is 0, so the parent of 2 equals 0, and that's the root. Um, and we can see here that's the root. So if we compare 6 to 4, we see that ah, 4 is less than 6, so right now we've maintained the heap property and everything's fine. We've, we've reheapified our heap. So that's 
in a nutshell how the add function uh, works. So we see here, um, here's the code behind it. So it's a Boolean. Um, yeah. So we're implementing the priority queue. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure why it's a Boolean in this case, but um, so if uh, so, the one thing we want to do first of all is check to see if we have room. Since this is a array-based data structure, uh, we have to check to make sure there's enough room, and then we're going to perform a resize operation. But if you've, uh, you know, if you've been around, if you've um, either read about the array stack or been there for the lectures or whatever, you know how to do that resize. Um, we're basically going to double the size of it, the same as we did before, and. Uh, and we can amortize that the same as we did before. <clears throat> so once we've checked for the proper length, um, we're just going to assign our data to the uh, last element in our binary heap. And then we're going to call this bubble up function. So the bubble up function does the swaps um, on our element as long as, uh, as long as the heap property is being violated. So we'll see that here. Uh, so the first thing we do is we're going to store the parent <clears throat> and then while i is greater than zero so if we end up at the root then we're not going to obviously we don't want to compare ourselves to our parent because we don't have one um, and we compare uh, the current location to the parent location and if the current location is less than the parent then we're going to swap them um, and then we're going to set our i equal to p so we want to follow our value up as we go. <clears throat> Since we've put now the value that was in i in p, um, we want i to be our current index and then p to be the parent of i. Um, so that's that's pretty simple. Um, so let's do some analysis. So uh, we've seen how to amortize the resize over the add operations. Um, we've probably seen that a few times. Um, so that's that's no problem. Um, we'll spend uh, time in resize proportional to the number of add operations, essentially. Um, setting the last location to x. So when we first add our element, we add it to the very last location, and that's, of course, constant time since we have access to the end variable and we can quickly find the end of our array. And then bubble up is going to be O of the height of the tree. So we're going to swap and the most swaps we'll do is until we get to the root. Okay, so remove. Um, okay, so now we'll look at remove. Um, so remove is a slightly more complicated. Um, so we have this question, should we maybe say we wanted to remove the root? We want to remove four. Well, four happens to be uh, the first location in our array. Um, so what can we do? Well, can we shift everything to the left? Well, you can try and do that. Um, you'd have to shift all these these indices down here. Um, so 9 would be at location 0 and 6 would be at location 1. Um, but if you do that, you would see that 9 and 17 both violate the heat property. And there might be more if you uh, investigated further. That's, that's only as far as I investigated. There could be more. Um, so that's not a very good strategy. Um, so what we are going to do is we're going to replace the root 4 with the last item 50. All right, so we're going to take this, this guy here and put it up to the root. And then um, we decrement n and set you know this last location to null. And then we are only violating the heat property at one place, which is the root. Um, so we haven't messed up all of our tree. If we shift everything, then we're going to mess up all of our tree. But in this case now, we have one place where it's violating the heat property and one place where we have to fix it. So that's what we're going to do. So here we see we copied the uh, 50 over to the 4. And here you can see that uh, having been completed, of course now this 50 does violate the heat property. Um, now we saw before how we did a, a bubble up 
in the case where we added something and we were violating the heat property but now we're going to do what's called a trickle down um, and a lot like um, a lot like previously when we add to a um, a treep or when we do a, a remove on a treep and we're violating the heat property there we do rotations to rotate something down but we have to be careful um, th these rotations are very similar to the uh, swaps that we do here but we have to be careful that we swap with uh, the child with the least priority in order to maintain uh, this heat property Um, so we're going to look at uh, 9 and 6, and we see that 6 is less. Um, so we're going to swap with the 6. Um, so that way the 6 now is above the 9. If we had done it the other way, the 9 would be above the 6, and we would still be violating the heat property. So it's important to, uh, to take that into consideration. And how we determine our, our child. Uh, so 50 is at index 0, so i is equal to 0. And then we want, uh, well, we were going to compare to the left and the right child. So we know that the left is uh, 2 times i plus 1. And the right is 2 times i plus 2. Uh, so the left child of the root is going to be at location 1. And the right child of the root is going to be at location 2. Since the 2 is less, then we swap out um, 0 and 2. Okay. Um, but now our 50 still violates the heat property. So we can look at uh, 50 is a now in location 2. Um, so the left, left child of 2 is equal to, uh, well, it's... 2 times i, which is 2, plus 1, so that should be 5. And then, of course, the right child is at 6. All right, and we can see here 5 and 6, that corresponds to 8 and 16. So we, we're comparing to the right ones, and we see that um, our value of 8 is less than 16, so that's the one we're going to swap with next. So 50 um, is going to go from here to here. <clears throat> Did I get, oh, sorry. To, to here. <clears throat> so we swapped out 50 and 8, and now uh, you can see here on our tree um, that we've now um, we've reinstated our heap property. We've reheapified our heap. So that's, that's how we do the remove. And then uh, the nice thing is, is that only the last uh, memory location was was really um, well. We didn't leave any gaps because we we've eliminated, we deleted at the at the last memory location, and then just reorganized our heap uh, so that it maintained the heap property. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at um, the remove operation. Um, so we get uh, t of x is equal to the root um, because, um, yeah, we always remove at the root. So we always remove least priority. which is the element at the root. All right, so then, um, yeah, we set the root to the, to the element that's, uh, we set the root to the element that's at the last location, and we decrement that last location. Um, 
we should set it to null using Java. <clears throat> Just to allow the garbage collector to work. Okay, and then we do a trickle down operation. So as we talked about, it's similar to the bubble up, except now you have to compare it to your left and right child and find the least one to, to swap it with. And if at the end of all that we've we've shrunk down too far, we resize. Now these are um, really the exact same comparisons that we made in our array stack. So this this three times n less than a dot length, and uh, and then when it's full, we uh, so if we get down to this size, we we um, allocate a new array that's twice the size of the number of items. And the same when it's uh, when it's filled up on an add. So uh, we've seen exactly how to amortize those. Um, and this is the trickle down. So I'm not going to get into it. As you can see, it's uh, it's just a lot of detail of comparisons. And um, um, so you've seen the basics behind it. And I'm sure you could write it at this point. Um, there's a little bit of extra work to compare your left and your right child. But other than that, it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so let's do our analysis of remove. Um, so we copy an element from the last position. That's O of 1. That's very fast. And trickle down uh, at an index i is O of the height of the tree. Right, so trickle down at i. It's going to be trickle down at the root, actually. Uh, trickle down 0. <coughs> Okay, so then what is this, the height of the tree or the binary heap, the implicit binary heap? Um, since that is sort of the uh, what's dominating the runtime of both our add and remove operations. So for a perfectly balanced binary tree where all levels are full except for possibly the last level, um, you'll notice that every level except the last doubles the nodes of the previous level. Right? That's fairly easy to see. Um, if I have an example here. Uh, so we have one on the first level, two on the second level, um, and then doubles every time except for possibly the last level. So this, this might be a, a binary heap, and so uh, one here, two here, four here. And then if I filled up this last level, there would be uh, eight nodes if, if it was full. So then uh, if we let h be the height of our binary heap, um, we can just start with one and then double the number of nodes every time. Um, until we reach 2 to the h minus 1. So uh, in this case here, let's say that this is the last level. So this is h minus 1. And uh, yeah, so we count, we double up to h minus 1. And then the last level, since it is the last level, there must be at least one node. Here we can see two, but there must be at least one node, so we're going to add one here. And that's less than or equal to the number of nodes in our binary heap, and that's less than or equal to if the binary heap was completely full, uh, if we had um, two to the h um, nodes on the final level. <coughs> Um, so yeah, and here's a little result. So if we add up all the, if we sum up one, if we take this summation basically, zero to n of two to the i, and that is equal to two to the n plus one minus one. Um, and that is something like this. Uh, you'll notice that if I did fill up, uh, yeah, you'll notice that if I have, say, well, let's do another example. <clears throat> um, to the 
So if I sum up all the numbers from called this level n plus 1. Um, and there was 2 to the n plus 1 um, items in it. Then if I summed up all the previous levels, so in this case this is equal to uh, 2 to the 3. Well, if I sum up all the previous levels, I add 1 plus 2 plus 4 and that's equal to 7, which is basically 2 to the 3 minus 1. So you can sort of see where this, uh, this little result here comes from. You can sort of see where this comes from. Um, so that means if we add up uh, all the numbers from 1, uh, 1 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2, etc., up to 2 to the h minus 1, and then add one because that final level might have one more node. <clears throat> then we get um, we add one to our exponent, which is the h minus one. So we get two to the h minus one plus one. So this minus one comes from here, and the plus one comes from here. So that's equal to two to the h, and that's less than or equal to n. So we can take the log of both sides, uh, and we get uh, log of two to the power h. And this is a log base two. So it's just h is less than or equal to log n. <clears throat> so we always have a log n height on our binary heap. And that brings us to our theorem. Uh, a binary heap implements the priority queue interface and supports add and remove in O of log n time since it's dominated by the height of the binary heap. And uh, yeah, so that's it uh, for binary heaps. Uh, all right. <clears throat> So now we're going to talk about uh, randomized meldable heaps. So these are a different version of the, the binary heap we just looked at. So it's a meldable heap class. <coughs> we'll have a priority queue implementation again. Um, so it's a binary tree, and not an implicit binary tree this time, but an actual binary tree that maintains the heap property. <coughs> so again, the uh, parent, the value of the parent has to be less than the value, or less than or equal to the value of both of the children. No longer an implicit binary tree stored in an array. Um, so the data is now in nodes. So this is an actual binary tree um, and no longer this uh, array with Eitzinger's method. Okay, <coughs> and it's not necessarily perfectly balanced. It can be any shape, um, but since it's randomized, as, as you might guess, it, uh, it performs pretty well. Uh, not because it maintains a good shape but uh, because of the way that uh, the operations uh, are implemented. So it's not necessarily perfectly balanced. It's not balanced at all, actually. It can be any shape. But there's some randomization in there, so you might see some, some certain distributions. OK, so since we're implementing a priority queue, we're doing add and remove. <coughs> uh, both of these are going to be implemented using a merge operation. So we're most of the most of the time we're going to spend talking about this merge operation and how it works. Um, and it's quite simple actually. So a merge of H1 and H2 takes two heap nodes, H1 and H2, and merges them. These are the uh, roots of the respective tree, or it could be the roots of a subtree. And it returns a node that is the root of a heap, or a, a meldable heap, containing all the nodes in both H1 and H2. <coughs> and they'll all be heap ordered. So, and then we can use this uh, sort of to implement both, um, both the add and remove. <coughs> but first, let's look at merge. Uh, so one thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that h1 is less than h2. So or h1 dot x is less than h2, since if it's the other way around, we're just going to uh, swap them out. All right. So we know that h1 is less than h1, uh, the data at h1 is less than the data at h2, so that means that h1 should be the root, all right, since we're, we're maintaining this heap property on this, uh, this meldable heap. <coughs> so now we can define our merge recursively. Uh, so if h1 is nil, uh, then we return h2, or vice versa. If h2 is nil, 
uh, we can return h1 and we're done so we have the base case of our recursion taken care of um, otherwise we merge h2 and h1 dot right or h2 and h1 dot left and we choose left or right at random and so <clears throat> this randomness is what gives us a good performance and so here is a picture of this <clears throat> so if we have uh, two of these meldable heaps um, and the root of the the first one is h1 and the root of the second one is h2 and you can see they're both heap ordered um, so now what we're going to do is since neither of them is nil <coughs> we choose uh, but we can assume that h1 is less than h2 so our assumption here is that h1 dot x is less than h2 dot x and we can see that's true because 4 is less than uh, 19 <coughs> So now we choose one of the subtrees of H1 at random. So either the left or the right. In this case, we're going to choose the right. So we're going to choose this subtree, and we're going to merge it with all of this tree. And we can see that here. Um, and so, uh, again, if we were to continue this recursion, which we, we won't, um, at least not too deeply, but if we were to continue that recursion, we would see that um, 8 is again going to be the, the root of this new subtree. Um, <clears throat> so then I would choose at random, uh, merging H2 with either uh, this subtree or this subtree. And 8 is going to, to be the root of this guy. And, uh, and we would continue until uh, we reach a nil. <clears throat> and as we're going to see the shape of this uh, meldable heap doesn't really matter as much as the fact that at some point uh, we reach a nil node and then uh, the merge ends so uh, we don't care about the shape so much we care that the merge ends quickly and we're going to see uh, how that comes about so here is the merge the code for the merge uh, so again, we have our base cases. So if h1 is equal to nil, we return h2. And if h2 is equal to nil, we return h1. So as soon as we walk off either of the trees, we're done. <coughs> um, otherwise, we compare and uh, we make sure that h1 is less than h1.x is less than h2.x. Um, so now we can assume that that's true. And then we randomly determine uh, whether we want to merge with the left or the right subtree. So that's here we say h1 dot left is uh, the result of the merger of the left subtree and h2 and then we assign of course we do our little uh, house cleaning and we assign the parent to be uh, h1 and then here we would do the same thing uh, I'm not going to draw it out it's exactly the same but with right substituted for left and then we return the root of this new uh, meldable heap h1 uh, so that's the merge operation in code. Um, and now we can implement add and remove fairly easily. So add uh, t of x. So we assign a new node uh, to our data element x. <clears throat> and then we merge the root with the new node. Since um, if we have a, a single node, that is itself a meldable heap, right? It's heap ordered because... Uh, you know, it doesn't have a parent or, or a child to, to compare itself to, so it is heap ordered, so we can perform the merge on it with the root of this uh, meldable heap. And then, uh, yeah, then the R, we set the parent to be nil, a little bit of housekeeping again, we, we increment n, and we return true. Um, and for analysis, of course, uh, making a new node <coughs> is O of 1, um, assigning these... Uh, Assigning the parent pointer as O of 1, um, we're really dependent on the runtime of this merge operation. Um, as for the remove, uh, we assign, since this is a priority queue, uh, we're taking the root of this meldable heap and we're returning it. So this is going to be return value. And then we uh, simply, since we're removing the root, we can merge just the left child with the right child. And, uh, and that will return some tree or some meldable heap that's heap ordered. 
And then if, as long as there's something in our tree, then we do our housekeeping, we assign our parent pointer, decrementer end, and return x. And our analysis is a constant time, that's to do this assignment, then to decrement n, and to do uh, this assignment here, plus the runtime of merge. So all that's left for us to do really is analyze the merge operation. Okay, so uh, to do this, of course, this is randomization, so there's going to be some expected values here. Uh, we're going to keep it relatively simple. Um, so we'll notice that uh, the merge finishes when either h1 is equal to nil or h2 is equal to nil. So if we think about the shape of the final tree, and uh, we're going to do some random walk in that final tree, and as soon as we walk off a nil node, then we're done. Um, and that's basically equivalent to uh, doing this merge operation. <clears throat> so a random walk is we start at the root r, we follow r dot left or r dot right with probability a half and repeat. So that's what we mean by a random walk. We just start at the root and we randomly choose left or right subtrees until we run off the tree. So uh, let's take a look at what that looks like. So the longest expected random walk Right, so we'll start by looking at the longest expected random walk in a perfectly balanced tree. <clears throat> um, so that's this this guy over here. Uh, this example. Um, so whether we step left or right, all paths are O of log of n. Right, and we can see that. Um, so we start at the root, and then maybe we go left, and then we go right, and then we go left. And that took us one, two, three steps. Um, maybe instead we went right and then left and then right. That also took three steps. Um, and you'll see no matter what we choose for a path, right, 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 we always take three steps. So all paths are log n in a perfectly balanced uh, binary uh, meldable heap <coughs> or binary tree. Um, whereas, if we have a particularly unbalanced tree, like over here, we start at the root, and then <clears throat> as long as we keep walking right, then we're going to keep walking down the tree. But as soon as we make a left turn, uh, we're done. Our merge operation is finished, since we've hit a nil node, and we're just going to attach the rest of the tree, uh, whichever one is left uh, as the child of the other tree. So, uh, in this case, the random walk is expected to be about a lot shorter. And in fact, if you have a, a tree like this, if your final tree is this shape, it's about two steps in expectation, as opposed to log n. So the most steps you're going to take with, on a random walk in expectation is O of log n. That's really the worst case that can happen. <clears throat> and that brings us to lemma one. Uh, so the expected length of a random walk in a binary tree with n nodes is at most log of n plus 1. So we're going to prove this by induction on n. So if n equals to 0, the walk has length 0, which is equal to log of n plus 1. And now we suppose that it's true for all n prime less than n. <coughs> so we're going to let n1 be the size of the left subtree, and let n2 be the size of the right subtree. And so we have this relationship, n2 equals n minus n1 minus 1. So n is all the nodes in the tree. Uh, we have 1 here for the root. And then n1 is the, the uh, left subtree, and n2 is the right subtree. <coughs> so the expected length of a random walk through our tree is 1 plus whatever we take in either the left subtree or the right subtree. So we take 1 from the root. And then, with probability 1 half, we take the left subtree. And with probability 1 half, we take the right subtree. All right, so that's the definition of expected value, is the probability um, times the value. So one thing we'll notice about the log function is it's a concave function. And now, I'm not sure how clear this will be, but if we take n over 2, let's say. Um, so twice n over 2. If I do, um, let's say n1 is down here, and n2 
2 is up here. Well, they both have to sum to n, so they're both going to be the same distance away from n over 2. Um, but uh, 2 times, or, or 2 times this value is going to be greater than this value plus this value. And that has a lot to do with, um, you can probably see it in the graph in, in that this vertical distance is greater than this vertical distance. Um, but anyway, this is a result you don't necessarily have to know, but it's not a very particularly hard result to, to figure out if you look at the graph for long enough. Uh, but it's a concave function, which means that the maximum is when um, both sides are, are have the same number of nodes. And we sort of saw that up here when we looked at our perfectly balanced tree and our uh, very extremely unbalanced tree, in that the unbalanced tree, the performance was a lot better of a random walk. <clears throat> so that's the, the same idea as we have here. So then the expected, uh, expected length of a random walk is 1 from the root plus 2 times 1 half times, if we assume that n1 equals n2 equals n minus 1 over 2, then we get to 2 times 1 half times the log of this. Uh, the 2 and the 1 half cancel out, so we get 1 <coughs> uh, plus the log of n minus 1 over 2 plus 1, which is 2 over 2. Uh, so we get 1 plus log of n plus 1 over 2. Um, this 1 we can say is log base 2 of 2 plus this and those logarithms. Um, if we combine them, then we multiply 2 times n plus 1 over 2. And so we get a log of n plus 1. Right? These are um, simple log operations that uh, you, if you don't know by heart, you should start to understand that you can look them up very quickly uh, and, uh, and figure this stuff out. <coughs> um, so our theorem, meldable heap implements the priority queue interface and supports add and remove operations in O of log n expected time. So that's a nice, uh, nice simple implementation of a heap. It performs uh, you know, surprisingly well, uh, given the fact that it can be very unbalanced. And in fact, the more unbalanced it is, the better it performs. So. Um, yeah, that's our uh, our meldable heap. And uh, uh, next lectures will be starting sorting, and that will be uh, essentially the last lectures. So it'll either be one or two, um, probably one. Uh, we have to get quick sort in at least, and then we'll see what else we get. But uh, that's it for today.